like to thank the organizers. It's, uh, it's always nice to be remembered still. <laughs> so today I'd like to tell you about uh, synchronous values of games. Uh, many of you have probably seen that games have uh, lots of uh, quantum assisted values of all different flavors and you're probably wondering why do we have to see yet another uh, notion of value of the game. So the first thing I want to do is uh, just go back to discrete uh, finite input, finite output uh, games with deterministic strategies and try to uh, convince you why uh, uh, for many games uh, a, a synchronous idea should really be included in the uh, notion of a, of a strategy for the game. I also would like to apologize to the people who were in Sweden a few weeks ago because not, uh, not much has changed. <laughs> so. so uh, We've heard a bit about games, but I don't think we anybody uh, talked about the sort of basic uh, classical uh, definitions. So here, when we want to talk about a game, we just have two finite uh, input sets, which uh, you can think of as the question sets for Alice and Bob, and two uh, finite uh, output sets, which you can think of as the, uh, the answer sets. And then there's also a, uh, a function that tells you when their uh, they're four-tuple of uh, for each pair x, y of inputs, they have to give a pair of uh, outputs, uh, a, b. And this tells us whether they give a, a correct pair or, or an incorrect pair. So when the value is 0, uh, that's when they lose. And when the value is 1, that's when we think of them as uh, replying correctly and winning. And then if you want to talk about uh, probabilistic values of games, you also need a, a distribution on inputs. So that's what pi is. It's the probability that they get an input pair x, y. So before the game begins, Alice and Bob uh, know all this information. But uh, during the game, they, they can't communicate. Uh, Alice doesn't know what question Bob got. Bob doesn't know what question Alice got. And they have to give their uh, answers uh, independently. So such a game is called synchronous. If the questions and answers, if the questions that they both receive are the same, and the answers they can both give are the same. And you have this rule that any time they're given the same question, they must give the same answer or they lose. And we'll see why that's uh, natural for many, uh, for many games. So each round of the game, the referee gives Alice a, a, a question, Bob a question, and they reply. And often there'll be some uh, entanglement. Uh, and as I say, they're, they're non-communicating. They don't get to talk to each other during the game. And the, the key is, this is, for, for some reason, this often bothers mathematicians, but the idea is that they're cooperating instead of competing. So Alice and Bob uh, want to cooperate to try to give a, a correct answer to the pair. They're not competing against each other. You can think of them as competing against the referee, if you like. And what the deterministic value of a game is, that just means that uh, Alice has a function. So each time she receives x, she'll reply with the same uh, answer, f of x. And similarly, Bob has a function that each time he receives a y, he'll reply with a, a, a g of y. And then you can uh, work out exactly the probability that they would win the game if they used that pair of uh, functions. It's just. Uh, this uh, is zero if they gave a bad reply, so it doesn't contribute. It only contributes when their reply is a good reply, in which case this is one, and then you get to sum those up. And so uh, the maximum this can be is, is one, and this will always be less than or equal to one if they ever give some uh, bad replies to uh, questions that have positive probability. So that's the, uh, that's the value of a particular uh, deterministic strategy, and then the deterministic value of the game is you just suit that over all possible function pairs. Uh, when, uh, when we have this game where x and y are the same and the outputs are the same, then all I mean by the synchronous uh, deterministic value is they have to both be using the same function. And uh, so let me show you some games where that's a natural thing to, to add. And a good one is the uh, graph coloring game. So here I just mean ordinary graphs are defined by a vertex and an edge set. Anytime x, y is, belongs to E, then y, x also belongs to E. So they're undirected graphs. 
And for Nupless, XX is not uh, considered an edge. A C coloring just means you have, uh, for each vertex, you're assigning a color one through C, and any time you have an edge, the two endpoints of the edge were given different colors. And now let me remind you of the notion of um, max cut of a graph. Uh, I want to talk about just not the ordinary max cut, but, uh, but more max cuts. So the, the ordinary max cut, uh, the easiest way to think of it is, suppose you try to two color a graph. Uh, unless the graph is two colorable, you're, you're going to make some mistakes. And what max cut is, is you'd like to maximize the number of edges that you color correctly using only two colors. And the C cut is the same thing. You'd like to maximize the number of edges you color correctly uh, overall possible colorings. Uh, the reason the half is in there is because xy is an edge and yx is an edge. So to, to count edges, you need a half. Uh, there's always this uh, thing that the, uh, the number of ordered pairs is twice the number of edges. And so, so the max cut is to do that. So when uh, c is equal to 2, that's the usual notion of max cut. It's, uh, it's well known that this is uh, an NP-hard problem. And that's basically because you have to do it over all, uh, all vertices. And what I'd like to show you is that uh, max cut is really the value of a game. But it's not the ordinary value. It's the synchronous value. And so max cut is a good reason for why we'd like to talk about synchronous values. Because when you think about it, you're really already thinking about synchronous values of games instead of ordinary. And so here's, uh, here's the game. The game is called the, uh, the graph coloring game, or the C coloring game, exactly. So the inputs for the game are just vertices. So Alice and Bob will get a pair of vertices. The outputs of the game are colors. So Alice and Bob will reply with a pair of colors uh, based on the vertex they got. So they get a pair of vertices. They reply with a pair of colors. Uh, and they win if any time the pair of vertices they were given was an edge, then the replies they gave were different colors. So they've correctly colored that edge. And this is uh, also one of the rules of the game, is that any time they're given the same vertex, they have to reply with the same color. And this is, this is very important, because if you didn't have the synchronous rule, uh, Alice could always reply red, and Bob could always reply green, and it would seem like you were two coloring any graph in the world. So it's really the synchronous rule that, uh, that prevents that. Uh, so uh, let me introduce another graph. We'll see why in a moment. So anytime you're given a graph, there's something called its bipartite double cover. And what you do is you make two copies of the vertex set. So I think of that as uh, V cross uh, 0, 1. And then uh, from 0, if there's, a, if there's an edge between X and Y, then you connect uh, X0 to Y1. So, so that's, the, that's the edge set for this graph. But any time uh, i is equal to j, you leave all those uh, disconnected. So, so notice uh, that every time you have a, an edge x, y in the graph, it shows up as two edges in the bipartite double cover, because it'll be x0, y1, and it'll be y0, x1, and those are distinct, uh, distinct edges. And now suppose we uh, put the uh, uniform density on the edge set we look at the graph coloring game uh, with that uh, density. Well, if we just did the ordinary value, then we don't get the, uh, the cut of the graph. We get the cut of its bipartite double cover. And this is basically because uh, Alice and Bob get to use different coloring functions. So it's just as if uh, Alice is cover coloring the uh, x zeros and Bob is coloring the, uh, the y ones. Uh, but if you do the synchronous value, then that's when you get the cut numbers. Uh, there's, there's a factor of two, and that's because of this, uh, this way how in the bisynchronous uh, each, each edge gets represented twice. Uh, so that, uh, that tells us that maybe the right way to define a, a quantum cut value is to just, uh, well, uh, solve uh, this equation for, uh, for the cut number in terms of the value of the game, and then anytime you have a quantum-assisted value, 
That's the way you should define the quantum cut number of a graph. But it should be the uh, synchronous quantum value of the game. I know I haven't defined that yet, but this is just motivation for why, uh, why we should talk about uh, that. And so here's, uh, here's what we can show. If we have a graph on n vertices and its uh, uh, adjacency matrix is uh, given by uh, a sub g, then this uh, quantum cut number is, uh, is given by an SDP. It's uh, this, uh, this quantity, uh, e over 4 minus a quarter. Uh, you minimize overall p's. These are just the uh, Gramians of unit vectors, if you like, or positive semi-definite matrices with ones on the diagonal of this uh, trace of AGP. So this is a nice uh, spectrohedron, if you like. And you, uh, optimizing something over a spectrohedron. So, uh, so unlike the, uh, the ordinary cut number, which is NP hard, this one is uh, solvable. Uh, this relaxation is uh, solvable by an SDP. Uh, if you'd like to see how, uh, how the ordinary cut number shows up here, if uh, you restricted this uh, set, uh, E sub N, to just looking at uh, all the matrices uh, in it that are, uh, have uh, zero, one entries, the correlation matrices uh, with zeros, ones, that really means you're, you're choosing sets of vectors which are, uh, some of them are, are orthogonal and some of them are parallel. And then uh, taking this same problem and optimizing over the smaller set is what the ordinary uh, max cut is of the graph. So hopefully with this motivation, let me now go into what these uh, quantum uh, values of games are, these quantum assisted values. So in general, if you play many, many rounds of a game and you give some, uh, your answers in some probabilistic fashion, then you can talk about the uh, probability that if Alice and Bob receive input pair x, y, they give uh, answer a, b. And given that probability density, this is uh, sometimes what we call a strategy, although formally a strategy is probably how you get the density, not the density itself, but uh, any case. Uh, for that uh, probability density, it's easy to see what the expected winning value of the game is. It's just uh, you sum over all uh, winning four-tuples of the uh, probability that they were given that uh, input pair times the uh, probability they gave a correct answer, and that gives you the expected value for that particular strategy. And when we talk about the various values of the game, what we're really doing is we're taking uh, our input densities and we're restricting them to some set, and then we're souping over all the densities that belong to that set. So uh, the sets that we're interested in are these sets of uh, densities or correlations called the, uh, the local, the quantum, the quantum spatial, the quantum approximate, the quantum commuting, and then also people have studied uh, non-signaling densities. So those, uh, those sets, uh, we, we now know that uh, the first, uh, that they're all distinct. The, uh, it was, uh, Slavstra, Will, who showed that the CQ and CQA was uh, not the same. And then uh, later, Colodangelo and Stark showed that uh, CQ and CQS are not the same. Uh, Bell is the one who showed that C loc and CQ are not the same. So C loc are the, the classical probability densities that can be realized by uh, random variables in place of uh, functions. And then CQC is this uh, quantum commuting and then the last one is the non-signaling. That's just all the abstract uh, probability densities, uh, all the abstract uh, tuples, P, A, B, X, Y, that uh, satisfy the, the natural axioms to be a probability density. So if you freeze X and Y and sum over all A and B, it should add up to one. But then there should also be the notion that there are, are marginal uh, densities uh, for marginal probability that if Alice receives X, she gives output A, or if Bob receives Y, he gives output B. So uh, each time you have one of these sets, you can uh, soup over it, and that's what we denote these different uh, values of the game by. Now, because, uh, 
because the uh, CQ and all these uh, all have the same closure. When you're souping, you might as well be souping over the closure. So, uh, so there's really only one value that they correspond to. The, the QC is uh, the one that we now know uh, due to MIP star equals RE can be strictly bigger than that. And then the non-signaling, there are many examples where it can be strictly bigger. And then the fact that the uh, loc is the same as the uh, deterministic just comes from the fact that when you look at these probability densities, the extreme points of the set of densities you can get uh, using uh, random variables are exactly uh, the deterministic strategies. And uh, this uh, maximizing this, uh, this uh, value is a convex function of uh, input, so it'll always be achieved at uh, extreme points of the, uh, the set of, uh, of densities. So let me uh, just, uh, if you haven't seen these before, uh, quickly remind you of what, what it means to be in CQ. That means that uh, Alice has uh, some finite dimensional state space, Bob has a finite dimensional state space, there's some uh, unit vector generally entangled uh, in, the, uh, in the tensor product. And then they have uh, projections. Uh, so Alice, uh, these are the, uh, the measurement operators. So for each input, Alice has a, a family of uh, projections that sum to one. And for each input, Bob has a family of projections that sum to one. And then if, uh, if when they receive x and y, they conduct that quantum experiment, the, this is the uh, formula that gives the probability that they'll get to output a, b. So all the densities you can get that way as you vary over all finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, all possible families of, uh, uh, I'll often call these uh, n, k, pvms, n for the number of inputs, k for the number of outputs is uh, exactly what CQ is. Uh, CQ spatial just means you do the same thing, the same tensor product, but you don't require the Hilbert spaces to be finite dimensional. And then uh, CQC is this more general one where you assume you have one uh, giant Hilbert space uh, shared by them both and that their measurement operators commute. The EXAs commute with uh, Bob's FYBs, uh, but they don't, the E's don't commute among themselves and the F's don't commute among themselves. And then any density you can get that way belongs to this uh, larger set. So currently there's been a lot of research devoted to computing these values for various games. Uh, and and uh, the MIP star paper, the, the way it showed the sets were different was by building a game for which the values were different. The, the same thing, uh, Will Sloster did the same thing when he first sh showed the first, the non-closure of CQ. He built a game that had a, a perfect CQA strategy, but no perfect CQ strategy. So, so the games have really been the, the best ways we've had to, uh, to see the differences between these sets. So uh, let's, uh, just because this hasn't come up before in, in this setting, let's, uh, let's, uh, let me discuss the, the C star algebra framework that goes into this. So if we have uh, one of these uh, games, and let's just for convenience say the input sets and the output sets both have the same size, n and k. Uh, then if you look at, uh, for each input, you take a, a unitary of uh, order k, then uh, the, the free group on uh, n free copies of the cyclic group of order k, that's what fnk is, and it, it's just a C star algebra that's generated by sort of universal unitaries, u sub x of uh, order k. So uh, anytime you have concrete unitaries, there's a star homomorphism sending the little u sub x's to the, the big u sub x's. Well, each uh, u sub x, because it's order k, it'll have k spectral projections, and that's what the exas are. And so those will sum to one. And now if you give me this game, and I write down this element of the tensor product of that C star algebra with itself, 
than uh, what the quantum uh, value of the game turns out to be. It's just the norm of that canonical element in the min tensor product. And what the QC value is the norm in the uh, max tensor product. So having, uh, when games were constructed where these two numbers were different, that means those two norms are different. And that proves the min and the max C star tensor products are different. And, and that's what Hirschberg's conjecture was. He, uh, and he proved that uh, the equivalence of this is the same as uh, Kahn's, uh, which was a, a statement about traces. And that's exactly the way things played out in the MIP star equals RE, a, a synchronous game was built that, uh, that had a, a difference between WQC of G and WQ of G. Now, uh, let me tell you what uh, synchronous densities are all about. So uh, just like with the, with the rules, we call a density synchronous. If uh, whenever you have the same input, the probability that they give different outputs is zero. And then uh, for each of these uh, sets we were talking about before, the loc, the q, the qs, I'll just use a superscript s to denote the subset of probability densities that obey this uh, synchronous property. And then all I mean by the synchronous value of the game is instead of souping over all densities in, uh, in that corresponding set, you just synchronize, you soup over the synchronous probability densities in that set. And uh, these densities and the corresponding values, uh, let me uh, describe what those are in C star algebra terms. Bernie, may I ask a question? Yeah. If I remember correctly, when I first started to read this stuff, they called densities joint probabilities. Have yeah. you seen it? I mean, it, I mean, one has to be just careful. And sometimes they call them correlations. Uh, yeah, right. that, that no, correlations and probabilities, physicists often confuse. I have learned that the hard way. But I, it's just for you, if you read all the literature, I think joint probabilities is often used instead of because they're not densities of a state or yeah. really, right? Yeah. Fair point. We also call them behaviors. I think that could yeah. be known, yeah. 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 I, I don't like behaviors. Huh? <laughs> 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 I prefer misbehaviors. <laughs> so, uh, so, so let me describe uh, what these uh, synchronous densities look like. Um, so uh, again, let's let's take a, a generic C star algebra that has these uh, these kinds of projections we need for an n k PVM, and then a uh, combination of two papers, uh, one done with uh, Ivan and uh, uh, probably most of you know the other people, Simone Severini, Dan Stalky, and Andreas Winter, and then uh, in a follow up paper with uh, Sam Kim and uh, Chris Schaffhauser, who's who's here. Uh, the, we uh, we finished uh, finished the project that we started in the other paper. So so first off, uh, one of these uh, joint probabilities <laughs> is in CQ uh, S synchronous. Uh, if and only if there's a C star algebra in a tracial state, such that the density is just given by uh, taking the trace. So remember what a trace is. It's a state with the property that tau of uh, uh, x y equals tau of y x. So uh, that that tells you that uh, just putting this uh, synchronous condition on a probability density forces a, a funny kind of symmetry, right? Because uh, this I can switch the uh, order of these two and get the same number, and that means that the probability of b a y x is the same as the probability of a b x y. So it's a cute little exercise to see why forcing uh, probability of uh, AB XX to be zero forces that kind of symmetry on the density, but, uh, but it does. And then the CQs are just the ones uh, that you get uh, uh, the same way, but now the A is a finite dimensional C star algebra. And that just means it's a direct sum of matrix algebras. On each matrix algebra, you have to have the ordinary uh, trace uh, scaled by a uh, uh, the dimension of the matrix algebra. And then you do convex combinations of these. So it's uh, uh, that's what a, a general trace on a finite dimensional algebra looks like. 
And then the somewhat surprising thing is even though CQ and CQS are different, as soon as you make this synchronous restriction, the sets become the same. And then the things in CQA, the connection with uh, con is, uh, they're exactly uh, the densities you get by not using an arbitrary C star algebra, but by using the, uh, uh, the R omega and its canonical trace, which is what shows up in the con embedding problem, and taking uh, arbitrary families of projections in there and their traces. Uh, there's also another way to think of it, though, is um, if you take things which are in the closure and then are synchronous, there's no reason a priori that they should be limits of synchronous things before you close up. And that was, uh, that was a hard theorem in the beginning to prove. But, uh, but it is the same. And so since it's the same, then uh, taking the, the Q, since it's a soup over things in here, it'll be the same as the QA. So for the purpose of computing this, you can just uh, stay in the finite dimensional case. Uh, and then by an extreme point analysis, instead of thinking of all finite dimensional C star algebras and traces, it's enough to just take matrix algebra and the canonical trace, because it'll have to be uh, by this convexity of the function. And now here's what the uh, synchronous values are from the C star algebra viewpoint. If you uh, take, uh, I've put an extra EXA on the other side. If, if you're going to do a trace, uh, EXA is EXA squared, and then you can move one of the EXAs to the other side. So that doesn't affect the trace. The reason I've written it that way is because this is a positive element. And this is sum of positive elements. So this will just be a positive element in whatever your C star algebra A is. And then uh, what's the synchronous QC value? It's just taking the trace of that positive element. And uh, you might as well take traces on the uh, universal C star algebra for, for EXAs, which is this C star FNK. You're just trying to compute the soup of traces. So this is what I think is interesting from a C star algebra viewpoint. Is there aren't very many cases where we have an element and we can actually compute what the uh, soup of all traces is for that element. And that's exactly the problem, uh, uh, the game theory problem. So, so sometimes the game helps us. Uh, the other thing that's uh, interesting here is there's a result of, uh, and this is the other reason I made it positive, there's a result of Kuntz and Peterson that says the soup over all traces is the same as the distance to the space of commutators. So uh, uh, and this is handy because you know when you're trying to decide if you've got the number exactly, if you've got it written as a soup one way as in an inf one way, if you choose something uh, in each of the two ways that's within epsilon, then you know you're within epsilon of the uh, the true value. So anytime you have soups and infs, that's uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the Q value, as I said before, you might as well just restrict to traces on the matrix algebras because those are uh, everything else is a convex combination of those. But that's also the same as uh, souping over, uh, you put RG inside uh, uh, this R omega and you apply the canonical trace. So uh, having, a, having a, a game where this uh, uh, Q and QC are different, uh, well that means uh, that's giving you something that you can't embed inside R omega, and that gives a, a direct refutation of uh, Kahn's embedding problem. His, his original question asked about if you had a C star algebra and a trace, could you always embed it inside R omega in a trace preserving manner? And uh, so this shows you can't uh, very directly and you don't need all the machinery of uh, proving that Kahn is equivalent to uh, the tensor product theory. I mean, that's still a beautiful theorem uh, and a beautiful theory, but, but for the purposes of uh, classroom teaching why Kahn is true, this is a shorter. Uh. So, uh, so now, uh, now that we know exactly what these values are, let's go back and see what uh, quantum cuts really are. So if you have a, a graph and you want to compute the, uh, the, the quantum, the QC uh, cut value, 
And what you're really doing is you're uh, taking uh, this canonical element, which in this case is just the EXA, EYAs. Uh, uh, so if X and Y are an edge, and you have an EXA, EYA, that means you've taken an X and you've colored uh, both ends of it A uh, anytime you have uh, some of that probability. So that's the times you're doing things incorrectly. And so it's, uh, it turns out to be uh, you're trying to minimize the number of times you do things incorrectly. And uh, then it's just some, uh, some linear function of that quantity. On the other hand, if you'd like, you can think of it as uh, uh, you know, uh, you're trying to maximize uh, this thing, in which case you're trying to compute the distance of this canonical element to the commutators inside the uh, universal C star algebra for these things. So that's, uh, that's what quantum cuts are. And of course, the, uh, the C value is just the same where I just replace uh, arbitrary C star algebras by uh, matrix algebras, but then I have to soup over matrices of all sizes. Excuse me, but what's this semicolon C in the previous slide? Oh, uh, C is the, uh, the, the closed linear span of the commutators. Okay. So I'm computing distance to, uh, to C. So now, uh, now that we have these things uh, in hand, let's look at the sort of standard uh, family of games, the, the XOR games, and uh, see uh, what, uh, what's new and different with, uh, when we want to do synchronous values. So uh, let me uh, define them uh, very carefully. So, so an XOR game just means you've got uh, an arbitrary input set. And your output <laughs> set is always, uh, I like to think of it as Z2. And uh, the, to be an XOR game, the, uh, the verification function has this uh, special form. It's, uh, it's one if and only if A plus B adds up to whatever F of the input pair is. So that tells you exactly, uh, exactly when you win. So that's, that's their goal, is to give outputs that add up to that. And uh, if you check and you want this game to be synchronous, that'll happen uh, exactly if f of xx is 0 for all x. So that's what synchronous XOR games look like. Now, in the, in the theory, there's this uh, thing called the uh, cost matrix of the game, which is uh, given this way. And uh, there's also a notion of direct sum of XOR games, which I want to talk about, which is an XOR game with uh, input set uh, X1 cross X2. And uh, what you do is to, to get a, a, a function, well, you just need a function to Z2. You just add the two functions. And of course, the uh, probability density is just the, uh, the product of the two probabilities. So XOR games are, are nice in that uh, you can not only, later we'll talk about products of games, but XOR games have this notion of sum. And it's uh, not too hard to see that the cost matrix of a sum is just the tensor product of the cost matrices. And then uh, we'll also want to look at the uh, symmetric part of the cost matrix. And then there's this uh, lovely construction, uh, which I really like, of course, is this off-diagonalization construction. <laughs> It's something in the 1, 2 corner, and it's uh, opposite in the 2, 1 corner. And that's uh, denoted by uh, B of G for the game. And now, uh, for those of you who uh, didn't know how long Slofstra has been around, uh, <laughs> there was somebody who thought he'd just graduated like two years ago uh, recently, <laughs> which is uh, quite flattering, I thought, but I think he was more upset by it. But, uh, back in 08, uh, Richard Cleave, uh, Slostra, Unger, and I uh, really analyzed, uh, did a beautiful analysis of the, uh, the values of uh, these XOR games. And they proved that the, uh, the Q and the QC value are the same. Uh, that really follows from uh, Cyrilson's result. And that the formula is, it's uh, given by this uh, SDP. You uh, take this uh, matrix B that you've built from the data from the game, 
And you look at, uh, this is the same E set I was talking about before. It's the, uh, the Gramian matrices with ones down the diagonal, except now they need to be 2n by 2n because B is 2n by 2n. And it's, uh, you solve that SDP and that gives you the value of the game. The other beautiful thing they did is they proved that the, uh, uh, so, so often people like to talk about the bias of a game, which is the, uh, how much larger the probability of winning is than a half. So it's uh, uh, something like, what is it? It's uh, winning minus a half times two or something like that. So two times winning minus one is the bias of a game. And they proved that the bias is multiplicative for direct sums of games. And so here's, uh, here's what uh, the synchronous values look like. It's, uh, it's very similar, except you, you use uh, this matrix, the real part, or the, uh, you know, the, the self-adjoint part of uh, A, and uh, soup over this. We, we're able to show that the, uh, the synchronous bias is uh, super multiplicative, and in fact that uh, there are games where it's, uh, it is strictly super multiplicative. Uh, the reason for that is uh, roughly, if you look at this matrix, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a nice way to make something self-adjoint. And it has the property that if lambda is an eigenvalue of BG, then minus lambda is, and, and all the multiplicities uh, match up. So these are very, uh, very symmetric in their eigenvalues. Whereas uh, these uh, may not, this A may not, A sub S may not be. And uh, what happens is when you do this uh, product of the game, you're tensor producting the AG sub S. And, uh, if the game is influenced by its largest uh, eigenvalue, well, it could be that its negative eigenvalue is much, much bigger in modulus. And so when you tensor, it becomes that negative gets squared, and that's uh, why the game can jump up in value. So basically what these do is these oscillate. As soon as you get three, then it's uh, like the determined by the maximum times the square of the minimum, and then uh, back and forth. So, uh, so we talked a little bit. Uh, I mentioned the. Can I ask something? Yeah. So, do you know if, if that can also happen for the classical game, for the non entangled value, or so this super additivity, or for the non entangled value? Yeah, when sometimes you see entanglement, but. Um, oh, uh, yeah, for low. Uh, this. You mean if I do the classical? Uh, yeah, it uh, it doesn't it it oscillates. Uh, we, we can't prove uh, that it exactly oscillates the same way, but, uh, but you can write down examples uh, where the classical value is also super multiplicative. Classical synchronous value. And it's the, it's the same, same, sort of, same sort of thing. Okay, so now, uh, now let me talk a little bit about repetitions of games. So if you're given two games, then the way to form their product is it's the game that has the product of the inputs, uh, product of the outputs, and uh, you need to explain what the verification function is, and the density is just the product of the densities. <coughs> the, the idea of the verification function, it's, it's easier if I say it in words than write out the formula. It's just you win if you win both games and you lose if you lose either one of the games. And uh, that's what this formula is telling you. And then the density is just the products of the densities. And so there's a, there's a love, and uh, then often people like to take a game and do the product with itself over and over again. And so it's known that the, uh, the classical deterministic values of games can, uh, can go up. So it's, uh, it's super multiplicative. That can be, it, it always uh, is bigger than or equal, but there are games for which it's strictly bigger. But uh, Raz's theorem tells us that uh, as long as the value of the game wasn't one, then as you do powers of the game, it'll ha have to tend to zero. And it tells you, so even though it might oscillate, it still tends to zero. And it gives you some, uh, 
some data uh, estimates on how the rate it goes to zero. Uh, Henry Yuan uh, did the same thing for the quantum value of a game. He proved that as long as it's less than one, it tends to zero and you get uh, an estimate on the rate. I, I haven't seen the proof for the QC value in the lit literature, but it must, uh, must be doable. Um, uh, we don't know how the uh, synchronous uh, value behaves. In particular, if the, it, so if the, uh, if the Q value of the game was uh, less than one, then because the synchronous value is always less than the Q value, you're souping over a smaller set, then it would have to tend to zero as well. But, uh, but if the Q value is one, we haven't been able to prove that the synchronous, and the synchronous value is strictly less than one, we haven't been able to prove that uh, tends to zero. And you'll, you'll see why in a slide or two, uh, some of, uh, get, uh, at least you'll see uh, an, an inkling of why this might be a difficult problem. In uh, a paper with uh, Ivan, uh, Laura, and uh, Andreas Winter, we produced a synchronous game uh, with a symmetric density. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of important because of this way that uh, this nice symmetry that uh, synchronous probability densities have. <coughs> Unless the pi is uh, symmetric, pi of x, y equals pi of y, x, then you're penalizing synchronous. And unless the rules are symmetric, you're, you're penalizing synchronous. So you, you'd really like if uh, x, y, a, b loses, then y, x, b, a loses. That's what we mean by the rules being synchronous, uh, symmetric. Uh, and so we found a game with symmetric rules, symmetric density, but it was still uh, the case that the, uh, the quantum was uh, strictly bigger. So, so we can prove it's uh, super multiplicative and that in some cases it's uh, strictly super multiplicative. Okay, now here's a, here's a curious game that'll maybe uh, give you some indication. So it's not a, it's not a synchronous game at all. But, uh, so the inputs and the output sets are just uh, two points. The only densities that they, the only uh, pairs they ever receive are <coughs> 0, 1, and 1, 1. They receive each of those with probability a half. Uh, if they receive 0, 1, they win if they return 1, 1. And if they receive 1, 1, they win if they return 0, 1. So uh, here's a perfect deterministic strategy. If uh, Alice gets input x, she returns x plus 1 mod 2 arithmetic, and Bob always returns 1, because notice all the winning pairs have, have a 1. And if you look for a second, you realize that that always wins <coughs> this game. And so, uh, so this game has uh, ordinary deterministic value equal 1, so all its quantum values are 1 as well. Uh, well, but it's not a synchronous game. This is not a synchronous strategy. Uh, but what happens if you demand synchronous strategies for this game? And uh, here's what happens. The, uh, the synchronous value of the game goes monotonely increasing to 1 as uh, you take products of the game. One half. So, uh, pardon? One half. Oops. Uh, at, least, at least you were... You were yeah, yeah. Each doesn't correspond to your text. One minus one over two to the end. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a strictly monotone increasing, and as you do more and more products of the game, it behaves more and more like a synchronous game. And uh, one reason to see that is, well, what, uh, what <coughs> stops the uh, synchronous? It's this um, case uh, when... Uh, see which case is it. It's uh, here, uh, if they get the same input, they're, they don't win if they give the same output, they're penalized. So, so that's penalizing synchronous right there. But as you do products of the game, the probability they get one, 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 one vanishes. So the, uh, the, the synchronous penalty uh, is vanishing as you do more and more products, and that's why the value gets to go up. But this suggests that maybe it's maybe it's a little bit uh, not so not so clear how uh, how synchronous values should behave. 
So uh, let me just wrap up with a few of the other things we do in this paper. So uh, for, for various different coloring games, we uh, were able to compute explicitly uh, some of the values. Uh, and we're able to show that if you make the coloring game, if you put a, a, a probability uh, that you receive an XX and a probability that you receive an edge, and you give those two different weights, <coughs> you can show that uh, depending on the ratio of the weights, uh, the synchronous value can agree with the ordinary value, but as the weights go to the diagonal, uh, they, they can uh, go away from the diagonal, they can separate. But, uh, but there are cases where the synchronous and the ordinary value are the same. Uh, um, and so uh, that's, that's the other case we show that they, they can be uh, different even though you have this uh, really lovely uh, synchronous game uh, with synchronous density. And the reason this is kind of interesting is that when you talk about perfect, if you ask for a perfect strategy, then for a synchronous game, a perfect strategy has to be a synchronous strategy. But uh, if you only ask for things, uh, if you have a game where there is no perfect strategy, then the best strategy doesn't have to be synchronous, even though. Uh, and then the thing that might be interesting from the point of view of trying to uh, work through this uh, MIP star equals RE and uh, try to make it more operator algebraic is we get uh, additional relations that have to be satisfied uh, in games if you have the projections that achieve the synchronous value, that achieve the maximum. And so, uh, so here's, uh, here's one. Uh, if you uh, let Q uh, be uh, this, uh, this element, for each uh, X and A, you uh, do this sum then you can prove that the uh, EXAs and the QXAs, well, they don't quite commute, but um, when you sum over A, they commute, sort of. And so that's a relation that has to be met by the projections if you're at the optimum value. So you can start to derive some of these new relations. So let me, uh, let me just show you the tricks behind deriving these optimality relations because I think these might be useful in self-testing scenarios. Because there, you, you, you know, when something is a self-test, it's going to have to, uh, it, it might not be clear, but there are some, it's the maximum of something, and so there's going to be some hidden uh, relations that the projections have to satisfy. And so let me show you the tricks we got for finding the, these hidden relations, because they might apply in self-testing as well. And, and I haven't seen them anyplace else in the literature. So, so here's the first trick. Suppose you've got your uh, set of projections that uh, attains the uh, QC value, and you, uh, you, you fix one of the inputs. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a, a self-adjoint element from the algebra and take the EZA set and replace it by conjugating by uh, these. So it's only for Z that I'll replace them. I'll leave all the rest of them the same. You know, for, for all X is not equal to Z, I'll just do EXA. And now, now what you do is you compute the value of this strategy. And that'll be a function of t. And at t equals 0, you've hit the optimal value. So for t non-zero, this must be suboptimal. So that function of t is peaking at t equals 0. You differentiate it, and you get a commutator relation. And uh, that's where that uh, EXA, EQXA commutator relation comes from. It comes from differentiating this uh, function. And that's, uh, that's how you get this. You, you get uh, that inside the trace, this has to be 0. But because it's a trace, you can put the h on the other side. And then you have an element so that when you do uh, the trace of it times any Hermitian, it's 0. And you can prove that forces the element itself to be 0, because you, you can assume the trace is faithful. Now here's the other trick. The, uh, the second set of tricks, well, again, suppose you've got an optimal one. Uh, you can either do it in MN or in <coughs> Z. And what I'll do is instead of just freezing a Z, I'll freeze a Z, 
an A, and a B. And I'll take uh, the E, uh, Z, A, and B, and I'll take a projection that's uh, smaller than E, Z, A, and I'll replace E, Z, A by E, Z, A minus A minus P. But of course, this doesn't add up to one anymore, so I boost the E, Z, B by that P. And again, this must be suboptimal. And when you go through and you calculate uh, what this does to make this suboptimal, it gives you another set of uh, orthogonality relations, another set of things that have to sum to zero. And then uh, in, the, in the QC case, you can assume you're in a, your, your C star algebra is a, is a type one von Neumann algebra, so you have continuous uh, uh, projections and you get to uh, take any, uh, any P of any small trace epsilon and, uh, and play this game. And that gives us uh, another whole set of relations that have to be satisfied by the projections that are optimal. So I think some of these same tricks might be useful in, in self-testing scenarios. And that's, that's my story. Thank you. <laughs>